If I... Yes! <laughs> Technology. Uh, hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to speak to you all today. Uh, please excuse me, I'm going to be like fiddling with a pair of glasses for uh, most of this presentation because I had laser eye surgery. Ooh. Ooh, what a crowd. Um, a little while ago, and I haven't fully recovered yet. So uh, this is one more, one more step to me becoming your transhuman cyborg overlord. Uh, but it's going to make me a bit sort of fiddly and slow. I'm sorry about that. Um, I don't know actually very much about any of you yet, so I'd like to do some audience polling. How many of you are students here? Okay. Uh, how many of you work in games like right now or recently? Okay. Um, how many of you have made and finished and completed and released a game? You're very good at this. Um, how many of you love dogs? I love dogs, doesn't everyone? Um, who here thinks a baguette is a sandwich? What was the question? Who here thinks a baguette is a sandwich? What about a hot dog? Sure. Yeah. Uh, is a cereal soup? Yes. No. All right. Uh, I'm not messing around with you. Uh, I'm actually going to come back to these ideas. It's called foreshadowing. Uh, this talk is all about my opinions on the value of games narrative and what good games narrative can be. Uh, and about a few of my experiences in games narrative. It is called The Right Way Games Narrative Done Good, which you can tell because that's what's written up here. But don't worry, I'm not going to spend everything, spend all my time reading everything that's on the screen because that would be silly. My name is Paul Dean. I used to look like this. Now I look like this. Um, across my life, I've been a video games narrative guy, uh, most recently part of the writing team on Pacific Drive, which has just been added to the reading list for the Nebula Awards, which is very prestigious. Uh, but as well as that, I have been an any nominated tabletop games designer, a convention organizer, a games critic and journalist, business co-founder, YouTube video person, speaker, lecturer, teacher, a mobile phone salesman, um, an accounts clerk. <laughs> You wait till you see what's on the next slide. I have been a Safeway shelf stacker. Uh, Thank you for your service. This is not going the way it's supposed to go, guys. Um, some of these jobs were good, uh, and some of them involved like more raw chicken than they did games design or writing, but actually almost all of them in some way probably did influence me as a writer and a designer and a person, and that's good because it's actually good to have a wide variety of interests and influences beyond uh, your niche in games, beyond games generally. It makes you a, a broader person and it helps you grow. Uh, this is all of the information I'm going to put up about myself because I don't want this talk to primarily be about me. It's not a memoir, uh, but hopefully it does show you that I do have my bona fides outside of Safeway. My work has reached millions of people in different forms, uh, and I've been very lucky to absorb and work with knowledge from all kinds of spectacular peers who are often better than me. There is a lot to talk about. Uh, when it comes to writing for games, certainly like a whole book's worth. Uh, I'm going to try and briefly touch on as many important points as I can. Uh, and I'm going to skim over some stuff. I might miss some other stuff entirely, but we'll have time at the end for questions. I might have good answers. As you can see, we've got a point of five points, really, of what is writing for games, what it could involve, where it could go wrong, why you should think about narrative and have some form of narrative design happening in your process and returning to where we started, where we maybe know the answer to the question of what really is narrative design. Games narrative is a curious and often underrepresented thing. A couple of weeks back, I was invited to the LA Games Narrative Meet, uh, where a lot of people like me uh, get together and we do squirrely secretive things that writers do. And I went around asking people, 
what exactly is games narrative or writing for games? And these are various answers that I got as I walked around LA asking those questions. Um, another way of approaching this is actually flipping the question and starting from the answer and saying, well, what games are considered to have good narrative and writing in them? Here are some. I'm really good at collages. Uh, there's some local heroes in here. All of these games have been lauded for their narrative, so the answer is clearly that good games, writing, and narrative design is a lot of words, uh, but sometimes it's no words. But sometimes it's a linear narrative, but sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes it's being funny, but sometimes it's being sad. Sometimes it's setting things somewhere totally different, but more than once, as you can tell from this list, it's about setting games in or near Wyoming. So clearly, we can all conclude that narrative design is most importantly about setting games in or near Wyoming. Here's the thing. More than a decade ago, I was at a BAFTA event in London where a panel of games writers uh, struggled to explain their jobs. Uh, and what was said back then has actually remained with me ever since, and that included the esteemed uh, writer of games such as Tomb Raider, Rihanna Pratchett, saying, well, we're making it up as we go along. Each of the games I mentioned is a different experience. Built with different tools, made of different systems, and many of them exist in different genres that have limited overlap. The narrative in Half-Life unfolds, and I guess functions, really differently to the narrative in Disco Elysium, or in Deus Ex, or in Baldur's Gate 3. The stories don't just unfold and are experienced in different ways. The games play in different ways because the players have different sorts of agency. Just like how there's not only many different ways to tell a story, but also many types of story which begin and end in different ways. And there always have been, from the historical fantastic tale of the Iliad to the morality and creepiness of Christmas Carol to the many conflicting and contradicting narratives of Rashomon to the deep, uh, imperfect, metatextual, unreliable narratives of House of Leaves. Just like in visual media, there are many different ways to tell a story, and that could include starting in the middle of the action, or with a text crawl, or with events out of sequence, or with a rap. <laughs> what a good idea. The main rule of storytelling has always been that it has to be engaging, whatever shape and style it is. That's true for your game's writing and narrative design, so just make it engaging, right? What does that mean in the context of all of this? Well, I'm gonna to return to some of these ideas. I have to keep you hanging. It's called suspense. Every game has its own narrative, its own way that it unfolds and is experienced, its own narrative needs, its own forms of player agency, ways that it's played. After all, games are an interactive medium. You all know this by now. They're not comic books, they're not films, they're not novels. And that doesn't mean that every part of a game, however, can be interacted with or should be. So what can and what can't? The answer is, of course, it depends. Uh, and very different player experiences are still games, much like there are many different sandwiches or types of sandwich. Games writing and narrative design are a sort of, I've written here, this is great. I've written here overlapping Venn diagram, but all Venn diagrams overlap, so good work, Paul. Um, writing can involve devising the dialogue that instructs and informs a player, and that could be things like voiceovers, and it could be barks. Barks are action-relevant statements that include things like, that doesn't work, or I'm reloading, or I'm injured, or I can't move, or they're getting away. But it could also involve designing a system that prioritizes these barks, depending on how important they are, how relevant they are in the moment, whether they should take precedence over something else, whether they're becoming too repetitive, whether they should delay a cutscene or a level transition or vice versa. 
could involve writing text for use in law, collectibles, found objects, maybe lost recordings, pages from old books, a ship's log that the captain wrote before an alien ate his ankles, but it could also involve deciding where these are found or in what order if their content is altered dynamically based on player choices or whether their discovery triggers other events or game states and so on. It could involve coming up with the graffiti and signage found across a level, or it could involve helping to design that level, shape the level itself, guide the flow of the player through the level, and determine what kind of visual and audio cues and clues they will encounter, maybe even how the level deforms in response to things that the player does or doesn't do. Writing can mean simply writing conversations for NPCs, or it could involve designing dialogue trees, which are full of branching dialogue that uh, allows for a wide array of conversation possibilities, the choices that reflect or alter game states, global variables, or that might reveal important information that might set objectives, which could change dynamically in response to the actions the player has made, the items they're carrying, the characters they have met or that are in their party or whether they took too long trying to solve a problem between a dragon and a village that the village actually installed the dragon as a mayor and everything's now fine. It could involve a lot of preparatory work, a lot of world building, defining key plot points, coming up with tone, characters, a law bible, pillars and references, all before the first lines of code have ever been written but it could also extend to outlining and prototyping the particular systems that the game needs to support all of this. Will NPCs need those dialogue trees? Will the world want collectible lore? Do you want cutscenes or do you want in-game events that don't interrupt the flow of play? Do you want to start right in the middle of the action or with a text crawl or with events that are out of sequence or with a wrap? Which of these decisions is the most appropriate, the easiest to iterate, the best use of your time and resources and the patience of your overworked engineering teams? Because you are scoping your narrative needs at the very start of the project, aren't you? There's no uh, one single answer to all of these considerations because much like the questions you might ask about game design, technical art, sound design, any other discipline, it depends. The narrative and writing needs of like Spelunky are clearly very different to the narrative needs of The Witcher. And ideally your project leads are gonna know this, have a good idea what they want from writers and narrative designers. And those narrative designers will be able to interrogate and articulate a host of ideas to help shape the systems and the flow of the story that unfolds. Uh, a lot of developers are still using proprietary tools for narrative design elements, things they've made in-house since each game and each genre can have unique needs. Some developers, some developers are not using any special tools. Uh, quite a few. Um, because they can already tell the stories that they need to through everything uh, that they already have sometimes. It depends. Uh, but I'm looking at my clock and we have to hurry on to, oh no. What a shame. Uh, I'm delighted to tell you there's lots of ways which games narrative and writing can go wrong, from the small to the large. Uh, and I'm gonna give you just some considerations and I'm gonna start with the small ones. Uh, and I wanna show of hands again, actually. How many people here are familiar with the original Deus Ex from 2000? Okay, I feel good about that. Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, a Deus Ex in joke, which is what a shame? <sighs> Can I be sure it's one person or was it two? <laughs> one and a half. Like one and a half is like Gandalf and a Hobbit. <laughs> um, all right, let's start there. Um, we're, hopefully we're about to play, I've never done this before, we're about to play a video within Google Slides and there will be audio. I don't, I've never done this before in a talk, so hopefully this works. Otherwise this is a wash. Uh, here's what that's about. 
Imagine it's the year 2000. Jared's getting closer, which I imagine might be anticipating a technical failure. I uh, it's the year 2000, just imagine. Uh, a small side quest involves you potentially talking to a hotel owner. With it. This is not in life, this is within the video game. Um, and you talk to the hotel owner and his daughter about some hoodlum who has put them in danger. And hoodlum, by the way, is a great word. I want all of you to put hoodlums into your games. Uh, you've got two choices. You can help them out, which means you remove the hoodlum from the equation, which is a very wholesome thing to do. And you know, you get some XP rewards and some appreciative dialogue, uh, and you have a safe hotel owner. Or you can not, in which case the hotel owner is killed um, and I think maybe you can loot his body and the daughter is like really distraught and you, your character sort of looks at what's happened and says, what a shame. Uh, but here's the thing, there's actually a third possibility. Uh, can anybody guess what the third possibility is? There's a hand right up at the back. Shout it out. and going west until I run out of money or get to the ocean, whichever comes first. Come on, Sam. Daddy! There must be something we can do. He was a good man. <laughs> I have some text here where, I you know what, I don't have to explain that. Uh, how many of you liked dogs? Anyone have any idea what's coming next? Can they better pet the dog? I'm Ren O'Brien. Wow. If you liked, I love dogs. There is, a, there is a world of internet content for you out there from the video game Oblivion where NPCs do things like they slowly sink into lava while asking you how your day is. <laughs> there is so much and like you can, everyone can go home tonight and you will be up until like 3 a.m. watching this stuff and some of it is divine, it's so good. Um, I can, however, however, I consider this and like what a shame to, be tiny but illustrative narrative failures, and they're not great tragedies, but they're slip-ups. They're both examples of a situation or an outcome not quite being anticipated or considered to be important enough to address or maybe not spotted in testing and in use cases. Uh, and they can harm player immersion, they can confuse player expectation, and they can lampshade the possibility of exploiting the game. Uh, students, there are a few students in here, do folks Nowadays, and I'm not talking about like the old biddies like me, but nowadays, do students still get taught about this? No. Oh, yeah? Because there, there was an era. Like the 70s, you know, you had the 70s, you had certain wallpaper and like flares. And I think for the 2010s, there was, this was it. We're all going to clubs and doing lunar narrative dissonance. <laughs> uh, about 10 years ago now, oh God. Yeah, I feel like it was really popular to throw around this phrase. And it's, it's actually still a very relevant phrase. It's a way of saying that the game basically doesn't play the way that it talks, uh, that its tone doesn't match its experience. And that's stuff like NPCs being portrayed as really you know, powerful and amazing in a cutscene, and then you have an escort mission with them and they're idiots and they die immediately. Uh, or you have things like your character laments killing someone and becomes sad about what they're changing into and then they pick up a bigger weapon and they advance their way through a skill tree that makes them like an elite murderous person. Uh, or Nico Belic, the classic Belic, Belic, the classic protagonist of GTA 4, who was constantly talking about how he wanted to leave his life of crime behind before he just got into a car and just ran over another old woman. <laughs> Games with ludonarrative narrative dissonance aren't necessarily bad. In fact, you know, they're often still great, but um, I think they're the reason that we actually love games that have more subtle, more consistent narrative because we don't still expect this yet. We tend to be really impressed when a game nails character and plot and tone because we're actually still raising the bar here. 
uh, it's we're getting better at these days, and this kind of stuff happens less, but it happens. Uh, and this is one reason why your narrative contributors should not be siloed, but be as closely involved with and aware of the rest of the project as anyone else. This is photo this is not real. I promise there are not people in there. <laughs> Much as you might start a new video game with a concept, uh, you know, concept arts and prototypes to set the tone, get folks on the same page, you should have a narrative outline and some early considerations there as well. Your UI mock-ups are going to help determine how much text is required and where. Your character concepts can be more than just a picture. They can be an outline that informs writing tone and casting calls. The systems and core loops you envisage in your game, such as whether you have branching dialogues, voiceovers, collectible lore, all the other things I mentioned, affect your narrative scope and also the sorts of tools your engineers and designers might need to use or even create. Uh, it also involves literally thinking about where the text in your video game goes. And I mean where in your files, what, whether it goes directly into assets or into a database, into string tables or anywhere else. Because text and dialogue, like anything else, needs to be constantly iterated on and improved, especially as other parts of the game change and are added or removed. You wouldn't hide a texture somewhere deep amongst your game files where you couldn't find it, especially if you needed to edit it again 18 months later. So why do that with text? And this is also not least, people are chuckling in the front row, people do this a lot. Uh, not least because you need to know where your text is if you're gonna localize it, if you're gonna turn it into other languages. Considering narrative needs from the very start of a project isn't even just a practical thing, it's just another issue of coherence. If you keep your writer and your artist separate, you can end up with dialogue, descriptions that clash. Um, we didn't have this happen much on Pacific Drive, but one small example I can think of, this image is not quite illustrative, um, but we had a, a particular fuel can within the game that was described as being plastic in a text description that was written quite a while ago, uh, and then required plastic resources to be scavenged and used as per the decision of a systems and econ designer. And we had an artist uh, shape and texture that as metallic. Uh, opposite to this, most of the time, we'd have design meetings where a systems designer and an artist and a level designer and a writer like me can all sit down together or at least remotely together, and determine why a particular part of a level might look a certain way, why it might provide the resources that it does, why it's laid out the way that it is, why it might sound a certain way, and that's how we ensured more consistency between art direction, narrative direction, player experience. Not involving writing and narrative in a wider discussion is honestly kind of a weird thing to do. It's a little like removing dialogue from a scene that you shoot for a film. You'd be left with the director blocking everything. You'd have the DOP choosing the lenses and framing. You'd have the special effects, you know, exploding. But then you'd have this attitude that's basically like, hey man, just say whatever fits in with everything else that's happening. You can just add that at the end, right? Oh no. <sighs> What a shame. <laughs> Remember I asked, you are scoping your narrative needs at the start of the project, aren't you? Or did you just try to incorporate narrative at the end? Why have you done this? Why does this still happen sometimes? Because it does. Some project leads or even teams see narrative as something that is pasted on towards the end of a project to explain what is happening in the game, to make it make sense, to tell the player what to do, like a didactic school teacher. But games are always talking to the player anyway. Games are talking to the player through their mechanics, through their UI, through their responses to input, through their failure states, through their level layouts, through their sound design, through their art cells, through their music. Remember earlier I said every game has its own narrative, its own way it unfolds and is experienced. I'm afraid you already have a narrative experience of some sort in your game anyway. That is how stories and our experience of life is. We are narrative creatures. Much like if you did remove the dialogue from a scene in a film or you never had any in any case, 
you would still tell a story. You can still set a mood with all of the other things. Your game is already speaking to a player in a hundred different ways. I'm going to pause because my mouth is very dry, I'm sorry. And it's also going to be story time. Yeah. So, many years ago, somebody wanted to, not that many years ago, unfortunately, somebody wanted to employ me for a couple of hundred pounds to uh, basically write the narrative for a small game over a weekend. The game was now finished, massive air quotes there, and needed a plot, which means I would arrive and write things to explain why everything in the game was happening. <gasps> Thank you. Uh, I didn't take this job, not only because it wasn't a game that I'd ever seen before, but I couldn't think of a more impossible task. The creative director or the head of the project should have already considered what needed to be communicated to the player and when and how throughout development. They would have built the necessary tools, they would have considered the pacing and the level design, they would have iterated any appropriate tutorials, they would have considered what's communicated through the environment, through character, dialogue, interaction, found objects, cutscenes, and of course with the game being finished, there is no ability to modify any pacing effect level layouts, create or alter assets, influence sound design, and so on. Imagine trying to create a plot, an explanation for things that are already absolutely locked in and immutable. But, at least to some greater or lesser degree, this is how narrative has sometimes been treated in game development. It's been incorporated later in a process and considered to be something kind of auxiliary rather than just as fundamental. Which is why sometimes we end up with the narrative elements that I've been talking about that feel incoherent, substandard, unsatisfying. Would you decide on your game mechanics at the last minute? Would you create all of your visual assets at the very end of the project? I mean, you could. Hopefully, by now, some of this is self-evident. Writers and narrative designers are not just experts in dialogue who can help bring characters to life and ask important questions about what a play should look like and why. They can contribute to all areas of creative direction, offer exacting written contributions appropriate to your UI, pacing, tutorials, and much more. They can help develop and iterate several of the game's systems, and from the very start of the game, they're clued into how it presents itself and communicates itself to the player. That's what they're experts in. The thing is, there is actually no one type of narrative designer, much as there is no one type of games designer, or there is no one type of artist. And asking what type of games designer you, uh, what type of narrative designer you might want, or what work they should do for you, how they should contribute to your game, is actually a similar flavor of question to asking, is a baguette a sandwich, or is a hot dog a sandwich? Or what about a quesadilla? Is cereal a type of soup? When I get in the bath, am I a type of soup? The answers are contextual and they're kind of some form of it depends. But that's also kind of less of the point. The point is, it's important to be asking these questions as part of development so that you can arrive at the answers together. Yes, there can be a lot of overlap and interfacing between what a narrative contributor does on a game, what other people do from systems design to scripting to sound design to level design to all the stuff I've said many times now. But that is the case in pretty much all games jobs and indeed people should be interfacing and syncing quite a bit on a video game project. That's how you get coherence. And a good narrative designer, like a good writer, doesn't add what isn't necessary. They're not going to be ruining, overwriting, over elaborating everything. If anything, they will actually be ruthlessly editing, honing, refining. Good writing and narrative design avoids saying anything that isn't necessary, such as reading out everything on the screen. It's problem solving, it's practical as well as creative. And it finds new and better ways to tell stories, to create experiences. Uh, one more thing. If you're going to have voice work in your game, you're going to need not only that dialogue written, but also recorded and directed. Who is going to do that? Will you book a studio with an audio engineer? Will you direct someone remotely? How do you present the dialogue you've written to an actor? Ensure it's delivered appropriately, accurately, that the tone and context fits when you click it all together like three, four, six months later. Hopefully you have employed someone with the appropriate experience to 
allow that to happen. How many people here have had the opportunity to work directly with actors in game dev? That's actually really pretty good. How many people here have been like an actor or a presenter? Um, you may well know then that studio time is expensive and you need to be prepared when you approach a professional actor so that they can create the result that you hope for, much like you can't approach me at the last minute and be like, hey, can you add a plot to the game? You can't approach an actor and be like, hey, can you just say all of these things, but like good and right so that they work in a year's time? Um, I'm wrapping up now. But finally, uh, hopefully I'm going to leave some space for like a few questions and things. It is time to return to where we started. What really is narrative design, aka writing for games? Uh, the answer is, of course, on the next slide. This is great, I've got two of them. How are you all doing? <laughs> it depends on your needs, but it's a conversation as important to your game and development as any other element of the artistic or practical direction. It's no one thing and it's potentially related to some or most or all of the elements uh, and your dev, line, dev pipeline and thus your final product. Uh, ultimately, I think I've failed to adequately answer or explain anything about this today because the topic is too big. But hopefully I've inspired questions and considerations as well as your desire to go away and research more about this. Uh, even give a few things a go yourself. If you haven't yet, uh, I would encourage everyone to fiddle around with a little bit of uh, narrative design. Just make a tiny twine game, write uh, and run a small role-playing adventure for you and your friends. Um, the most important thing is, I think, to start the conversation around writing and narrative design, like it's important to start the conversation around what is a sandwich or a soup. Question your assumptions, explore your needs, don't leave things to the last minute. Making good video games is hard, you know this, leaving things to the last minute is what you did with your homework when you were 12. I'm staring over my glasses at you all now because I'm your dad, uh, and you're not 12, you're much more shrewd and curious and savvy now. You ready for trying things yourself. Thank you, everyone, for listening to me wall for about 32 minutes. Does anyone have any questions about this presentation, about Pacific Drive, about other things I've done, about writing and narrative design? I am here to field all of them, and I will do my best. Thank you. And I can take my glasses off. Chap in the second row with the glasses and, oh, I'm sorry, you've been beaten by Ario, hello. I have the mic. <laughs> uh, what's the project where you did end up taking, but they gave you the least amount of time to work on, and how did it turn out? The project that I, a project that I did take, but had the least amount of time on. Oh, um. Like crunch time. I, the most, the most honest and boring answer would be like some marketing stuff for some indies, but that's not actually that interesting because there's a lot of indie folks who I've helped in the past like write press releases and marketing material for because being a games journalist for many years, I looked at a lot of press releases. Um, the better or more interesting answer is a tabletop project that I won't mention, which was, um, an entire scenario which involves like me. I don't make the final map, but I will make like a prototype map which goes to a proper uh, cartographer artist, uh, but also come up with all of the NPCs, uh, come up with uh, multiple different quest plot lines that happen within this self-contained scenario. And the thing with like any tabletop RPG stuff, like anything else, is you need time to test it because the moment you bring it to the table, uh, I think the ratio, maybe this is true in video games, but a thing we've said in tabletop is one hour at the table is worth at about 10 hours of design. The moment you put something in front of people, they immediately break it. And you have to do that with tabletop RPGs. Uh, but I've had some very short turnarounds for written stuff like that. And it's, it's very writing heavy, a lot of character creation. Um, and you pay for that later because you find out, you know, nine months down the line, there are people on internet forums saying like, 
these stats, these values are not balanced properly, or like, why would I use this particular power or weapon? Because this other thing actually does a better job of it. And if you had more time with, you know, testing and players, you'd find that out pretty fast. So something like that, I would say. Chap in the very good shirt, who was speaking just now. Thank you. Um, when I first played Pacific Drive, actually, my, one of my first thoughts about 20 minutes into the game was how well the player motivation meshed with the in-universe motivation for your character. Was that something that was discussed super early on? I joined the team, uh, I want to say about halfway or maybe a third of the way into the project. So. Um, to be clear, the narrative lead on Pacific Drive was, was my boss, Carrie, who was excellent, who had put together uh, a lot of the initial script and the concept for how some of those things would happen. We were, I remember joining when we were still balancing and cutting quests or changing quests a lot. And I feel like I remember that being an issue of discussion of like, why would a player want to do a particular thing? And in fairness, we didn't want to be over, overly directing players. Part of the fun of the game is you can go off the beaten track and just find stuff and collect things. Um, a lot of that ended up being writing that sort of fell to me because, spoiler, all the written text in the game ended up being, apart from subtitles, which are Carrie's script subtitles, Everything is me, and I'm talking menu text, I'm talking all the law collectibles, the description of every material, and then the Sony thing where Sony sends you a document, and they say, hey, you know, a trigger and a button are two different things. We don't say press, we say hold, or we don't say hold, we say press, and then verifying that all of that is correct, and then marking everything for localization, uh, and making sure all of that works, so lots of HUD UI stuff. Um, we wanted to, Make things interesting to find, I think is the best way I can describe that. So, uh, I think in terms of the main plot and directing players there, Carrie, I think, did a really, really good job of cutting things up into almost like TV episodes of like, we're going to reveal some more character information in this mission, and also another surprise or another small twist or a bit of background lore and then people will drive around a bit more, and then we'll give them another bite-sized thing, and it'll form like a small TV arc. Uh, and on the flip side of that coin, I was trying to write a lot of things that would feel rewarding to find in their own right, and maybe interesting and worth squirreling around for. And one of my influences was Horizon Zero Dawn, and how I would love just running off into the wilderness and finding some random note, and being like, I want to play this log file now, or I want to read the next diary entry by these people to find out what happened to them. Um, and to me, that felt like one of the best ways to motivate a player to go off the beaten track and find things and dig into stuff. Um, and this extends a bit more beyond your question, but the other, in my head, I was also thinking so much of this is going to be roguelike, it's going to be out of sequence. So we can't expect players to find a coherent narrative that matches carry. I've got to find, got to, got to give people interesting little snacks that exist on their own but if they want to, and if they compile a wiki on the internet, they put them together and they realize, oh, this thing refers to this thing, and this thing touches on this, and you'll never have a complete jigsaw puzzle picture, but you'll have about 50 or 60%, and you'll be able to see a linear sort of, an arc of different events. So I don't know if that gives you a great answer, but it's, it's so much of a game about finding stuff that we wanted to give people treats and hide stuff, and make them want to go out there and find the next thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's great. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, I have decision paralysis. Okay. Oh, no, what a shame. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so my question is about something that I have been learning a lot. Uh, how do you deal with the mechanics reshaping the narrative? Like, do you usually end up rewriting the story a lot? Uh, that's that's, I think that's one of the most important questions. And I think, uh, in my opinion, that happens depending upon where you join the project. I think if you're at the very start, hopefully you have influence on those mechanics yourself uh, and designing some of them. And again, this is another thing in, in a lot of tabletop RPG stuff I've done. I've been able to create scenarios and create the values that are like the stats for an NPC or like how big something is, how long something should take. 
And ideally, it's great to be able to do that in a narrative design context where you don't just write plot, but you also say, like, the player waits for this amount of time, or this thing does this amount of damage. Uh, the reality of players having agency and doing things that you don't expect is inevitably, um, they fiddle with that and they break that a lot. So I don't, I want to say it's something more than just a lot of iteration, but my experience, again, like we had a lot of, I hope it's okay to say this, we had a lot of tutorial hiccups on Pacific Drive where the pacing of the tutorial conflicted with the pacing of the uh, voiceover and uh, also players wandering around and not being able to find something that we're, we're saying, hey, pick up the thing that's on the thing, and the player's like, what? Because they've wandered over somewhere else to look at somewhere else, because the worst thing about players is they have free will. <laughs> Don't worry, we're working on that. Um, but that, that was simply iteration of being like, well, we can literally physically put some boxes in the player's way at this point, which will take a few seconds to clear out, and that'll allow the dialogue to play. Um, we need a way to, uh, we ended up having a way to like store messages that you can replay them later and split our audio between uh, audio that was extremely rele relevant to the situation right now, like you've got to do this. And like occasionally people will just interject on the radio and tell you random background stuff or like some, there's a lot of weird radio transmissions that play and there's certain flags in the game that are like, no, don't do that right now because that's gonna interfere with the more important stuff. And we just had to iterate that by sort of um, trial and error. And it's, I feel like it's a really sloppy answer to give you, but the very honest thing is like, we didn't really know until we started trying it and we were like, the pacing of this is wrong, this takes too long, or this breaks, or the, the flag here when, you know, this thing doesn't play until a player touches something. And it's like, do we make them touch it? Do we disable that flag? A lot of stuff like that all the time. And it's, I don't know how else to put it, it's really, really fiddly. Um, but I think that's one of the ways that you do that and then you try and make that not look obvious from the outside. But that's also my experience of so many video games is, I don't know, you run into a place and someone's like, hey, talk to me. And you just run around and you talk to some folks and you pick up some items and you practice with your bow and the guy stood there going, hey, hey. Because player agency is a terrible thing. Hopefully that makes some sense. Um, yeah, I don't know, a lot of iteration and practice. Yeah, no, for sure helps. It helps other things as well. Because, like, the mechanic works in your head, but then when you try it out, you have to change it, and then it hurts. I, this is a huge tangent. I actually designed the Wolfenstein board game when I was 12 years old. Um, and it was great. I designed it all on paper because I had, like, some toy soldiers and I had, like, the, this old Hero Quest board game. And basically, you put soldiers on a hero quest board, move them around, have some rules for like how they shoot at each other. You've got the Wolfenstein board game, you're gonna make a million. And it was terrible when I actually tested it. Because whatever like ideas you have of these things in your head, they never, you have to immediately start prototyping and trialing and iterating. And I think this is one of the key narrative problems is people assume uh, the narrative part is gonna be like kind of didactic and it's just gonna flow in a certain way. Um, and players, players don't do that. Players respond depending on the game and the genre in so many different ways. Okay, I think we got time for one more. I'll go choose. Okay, let me get a Hi, so um, when you're writing an overall narrative for something, you probably mm -hmm. have a lot of passion for a particular aspect or a particular part that comes to be. But then there's a huge chunk of writing that goes into all of these side things, these enormous amount of little things, items and tabletop games, NPCs and tabletop games, uh, object descriptions for collectibles, things like that. Mm -hmm. How do you balance out your own creative energy and how much you're willing to put into those when it's kind of like you're taking away from your baby? And then partially that, how do you notice that you're kind of suffering burnout when you're doing all of those little side things if that, if that happen. That's a good question. Um, that I feel like you've inspired like two different thoughts in my head at the same time and I'll try and articulate both of them. Um, one of them is 
I don't know, I hope this is relevant. A few people have said this now in board game, in, in video games, board games, all narrative game stuff is like, if you wanna, first of all, if you wanna do a lot of writing and create a world or make a lot of stuff, like, this is a terrible thing to say, but write a book because there's a lot of folks out there who will do quest design, scenario design, narrative design, and they're like, I wanna feature all of these characters and all of this stuff, and I wanna show the player this, and I wanna, and they're much more, they wanna tell a story rather than create something that is interactive and that inspires player agency, and it, like in Pacific Drive, inspires you to go out there and find stuff for yourself. Um, it's not necessarily relevant to everything that you're saying, but it can be, people can get carried away making stuff that they want to show you rather than they want you to be interactive, want to, people to interact with. And like this is a classic D&D problem where people will spend ages world building and they'll make a scenario and it's like, I want to show you the king and I want to show you the castle and then you go here and you do, and players are like, yeah, but I want to jump in the moat or I want to kill this guy or I want to go over there. So, but I didn't write for that. And that's still a thing that I find myself talking to people about a lot. Um, so, I, some of that, I think, scope that in a way where you are making sure that everything that you're making is going to be interesting to the player and something that will add value to the player and something that the player interacts with and gains something from, something that is for the players and for the player experience rather than just a sort of creative storytelling experience. Uh, the other side of that is... I. The other side is almost the opposite where I feel like you can really lean into that if you're thinking of creating an experience that is actually not as linear and where like, like Oblivion or Morrowind, you want people to open the front door and just go anywhere. And that's maybe not so bad if you wanna write so much content and so many different things in addition to a main narrative somewhere. I haven't played Oblivion much. I played Morrowind ages ago and I played Skyrim and I don't actually care about the main plot in Skyrim. I enjoy going around and like looking at something that looks nice and meeting a dude and the dude's like, could you go in the dungeon and like stab the thing and get the stuff? And I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. And I go and I stab the thing, I get the stuff and I go, there you go. And he goes, that's great. And I'm like, I would do that a hundred more times. And he's like, do you want to go here and talk to that? Not really. I just want to, you know, go for another walk and look at the mountain. And, but now I'm like, I'm one tougher. So I can fight a dude who is like one bigger and get something that is worth one more gold piece and do it again. Um, can you, is this something that you're able to talk any more about or give any more details on, or? Sure, I mean, just in my particular case, I'm writing a tabletop uh, recently, mm -hmm. and I found it enormously difficult to come right at the end and go, okay, well now I've got to add a fiddly little paragraph that goes in front top of everything in my book, because I didn't do it as I was going through necessarily for everything. And now I've got to backtrack and finish everything. and then. You're doing that for three, four weeks of just a few hours here and there, and you go, this is taking longer than writing the rest of the book was. And it's just like, how do, I, how do you balance your energy for doing that kind of like finishing busy work versus the stuff we're really excited about for at the forefront? I mean, I feel like that for me is a lot of my work actually in games is like when I joined Pacific Drive, I had an enormous amount of creative work to do. And when I finished Pacific Drive, I was doing an enormous amount of... Um, Seth Rosen, the design director, who's a good friend of mine, said to me, well, we were having some like late night talk, and he said a lot of game development is data entry. And it really was a case of like opening up individual assets, making sure things are tagged for localization, iterating something, making a new build on my machine, seeing if the UI looks right again, trying a part of the tutorial, is it paced right? Um, and trying things over and over again, and bef before I just turned something into another test case and throw it at QA, who already had like 100 of those. And I think also as someone who's done a lot of creative writing and journalism, so much of that process also begins with, you have a great idea, and I'm gonna write this short story, I'm gonna write this cool feature where I interview like a famous games industry person. And it always, the start of anything is always creative and inspirational, and the end of it is always the grunt work and the I've got to edit this, like it's 10 words too long here and this image doesn't fit in here and these things clash and I realize that this thing that I wrote six months ago at the start doesn't correspond with this thing that I just wrote just now and I have to do an edit pass. When I worked on Paranoia, 
That's a huge, huge rule book. And I did that with Grant Howard and James Wallace, two really good games designers. And I did the final edit pass of the whole book. And that took me, I don't know how many days of just sitting in front of my PC and being like, how have we written so much? And going through and being like, most of this is accurate, but like these things don't agree. This thing in chapter one that one person wrote six months ago doesn't agree with this other thing. This thing is spelt wrong. This thing refers to a, a paragraph that doesn't exist anymore. And I don't know. I think you've got to save energy for that. I mean, that's what I, a lot of good authors I know do as well. They'll have a wonderful idea for a story, but a lot of the end of any writing process is you've got to put it down for a while and then come back to it and you look at it and you're like, this bit's too fast, this bit's too slow, this bit's too boring, I've got to change this, I've got to... Just like a lot of filmmaking is chopping and changing it right to the last minute. I don't know if that's a great answer, but... Because it's also not very romantic, but I think it's the truth of a lot of writing and game dev. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was some really long answers for you.